dialogue or move the discourse forward if we accept that? That's sort of... Well, then the, qu the question comes to be, which questions matter? Uh, that's a serious problem. And that's about uh, somehow taking uh, other people's dilemmas and, and achievements seriously. Taking it, It's about putting forward what matters uh, in a non-arrogant way um, and, um, and without the illusion of an equal playing field. You know, it's about taking those kinds of questions seriously with the various ways that we all inherit the histories of trauma and violence. So that it's not the imagination of some kind of, of a demo a democratic playing field. Um, it's about asking seriously what matters and to whom, and, and therefore what is, uh, what is one called upon to do okay. because of what matters. Well, thank you. Yeah. Wait, wait. When you missed. Missed. Sure. So I was just going to say, along the same lines, you talked a lot about um, diversity being sort of the gold standard for now, and yet we still have a whole lot of problems with, oh, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> with not accepting that. So I wonder where that crossover is if we're, we're saying um, it's not a separate but equal thing, <coughs> but let's recognize our diversity and say it's not an even playing field. Well, then how do women get well, paid the same for doing the same work? Well, who's to say that diversity is to produce equality? What a strange uh, illusion. I'm <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a remarkable <laughs> illusion. <laughs> um, when I say that I think diversity is the name of the game of capital accumulation these days, I, I, I mean that as a kind of um, low-key descriptive statement, uh, that I'm looking around at where the action is um, in the um, World Bank, in the NGOs, in the major transnational corporations. I'm looking around um, at the particular kinds of banking practices, genome banking practices, the particular sorts of library, of archiving and management practices of variation. I'm watching an, uh, an extremely expensive, elaborate set of practices around uh, that are a bit like the great collecting expeditions of early modern Europe, where certainly the uh, collection and arraying of diversity was the name of the game. It, it, that is the history of modernity uh, in its colonial form. Uh, that surely at least one of the things going on these days is a contemporary version and of that kind of proliferation and taxonomizing and putting into action of variation. Okay. No, no wonder that new kinds of racial discourses are emerging in biomedical practices and that it's very hard to get a grip on how, if one wants to be, for lack of a better word, a progressive person, somehow, you know, an anti-racist person, how does one relate to the uh, various um, new biomedical descriptions of populations that involve the relevance of ethnicities in ways that we thought we didn't have to pay attention to anymore? For example, in uh, tissue uh, matching practices, or in blood banking and transfusion practices, or in getting good enough databases into the na national and international police forces to get the right populations of reference, or how do we deal with what constitutes a population? It's not race in the early 20th century way, but there are various kinds of biologically marked populations emerging in practice and knowledge production that we had better get the details on. We have the details on the mid-20th century stuff. We know how to do the liberal population uh, compromises about there's more variation within populations than between populations, and there's no biological tie to culture, and, and, and we know how to win the last war. <laughs> we don't have a clue what's going on, we as a broad, uh, literate population, you know, living inside technoscience, which is my chronotope for when we are. You know, we, we live in a chronotope called technoscience. Right, because Alan. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Let's uh, be fair. Yeah, go when on. when you mentioned these the Cyborg Manifesto and referring it specifically to the context of the early '60s and the NASA Cyborg in Outer Space, of course, I'm very interested in that. But I think more than that, why the Cyborg Manifesto is such a landmark is because for feminist theory and for leftist and, and radical politics in general, it, it turned us away from our anti-technology yeah. attitudes, 
from the late 60s. <coughs> and it was very important in that sense. And now that you have the figure of the companion species, which seems to be at the same status uh, as the cyborg in the, in the genealogy of your work, and so I'm taking very seriously the specific and perhaps multiple meanings of the term companion species. And my question is, the figure that came in between those two, so to speak, of Uncle Mouse, the transgenic uh, organism, seems to not somehow, it seems to fall in between the two, uh, the cyborg and the companion species, not to have the same status in your work as the other two. Is that a fair That's perception, or does it, and, and that. where does it come in, in that mm -hmm. transition? Um, the genetically modified organisms and the new forms of genetic property seem to me um, maybe do form a third category in a way. They really aren't the cyborgs of the NASA Man and Space Projects. By the way, I love that paper that you did on the, the whole history of the enhanced man cyborg project in the Star Trek and NASA scene, but Thank I you. learned a lot from that. But the, um, uh, I, th I think the genetically modified organism kind of materiality would would merit a, um, a kind of figural analytical work that is neither companion species nor cyborg. But another way of putting it is that this is a strange family of familiars, that this is a haunted family, uh, and that the, um, the natural siblings, the kinship system includes the companion species, the cyborg, the genetically modified organisms, the, um, the, the various kinds of entities out of which universes explode, these imploded germinal entities out of which ways, entire ways of life explode. Uh, so I, I tend to think in terms of kinship systems more than oppositions, and I think the companion species and the cyborg and perhaps and the genetically modified organisms are a kind of kinship system. And by the, the a kinship system that does uh, damage to our notions of nature, surely, but also to our notions of culture. So that neither nature cult nor culture emer emerges unscathed from meditations on these modes of being. And nature culture ends up being one word. And humans invented neither nature nor culture. Uh, and therefore, social constructionism as a strategy of analysis in all its variants ends up being kind of anemic and nutritionally deficient. But it has still something in common that's humanity. Uh, you know, I, I keep getting this image of the Lewis Thomas mitochondria symbiont and, and the, the question of does yeah, the that's technology there. then become this symbiont that's less machine and more, you know, human, like, um, you know, prosthetics almost, and, <coughs> or the higher level, the, these implants and whatnot. It is, uh, does that enter into your... Yeah, it does, opinion? absolutely. And, and one of my favorite figurations for the nature of individuality for uh, complex organisms talked about a little bit today is a, an entity called Mixotrixa paradoxa, okay. who uh, lives in the hindgut of a South Australian termite, mm -hmm. uh, and is an entity of a complex uh, cell with a nucleus, and five obligatory symbiotic uh, bacteria-like organisms that exist in about a million copies that live in various degrees of integration with the, the thing with the, the proper nucleus. And the whole thing counts as Mixotrixa paradoxa, that whole thing of a million and one entities counts as one. Yeah, right. And you have a range of obligatory symbiotic relationships of various degrees of integration short of mitochondria. Mm -hmm. The mitochondria are so integrated with the eukaryotic cell that they really no longer count as an independent life form. The various parts of the human genome that don't seem to be coding for anything, including not any control functions, that might be the record of past infections and are just kind of going along copying themselves are so integrated as not to count as somebody else anymore, but historically speaking, probably were somebody else. So that we are, in the most literal material sense, the record of the many somebodies that are the condition of the possibility of this particular kind of oneness. Right? That oneness comes in flavors.